Welcome to the Rocky Mountain AI Interest Group. The following presentation entitled AI Startup Pitch Night took place on May the 24th, 2023. In the meeting, seven people pitched their AI startup ideas to a panel of two judges. For future meetings, check out our meetup group and also our website at rmaiig.org. Welcome to the Rocky Mountain AI Interest Group. Uh, my name is Dan Murray. I help run the group. And um, let me just send out a big thank you to some of our volunteers who help, who help uh, keep this thing going. Uh, Richard Gann is my co-founder. He's the wizard behind the scenes doing all the tech work, including uh, editing all the meeting videos. So he's done a fantastic job putting up those meeting videos. We have uh, board members, Anna and Sean, who put in a ton of work on this meeting. Thank you, guys. Uh, Grace and May, two other board members, are working on the next meeting. And uh, Grace has been helping us with, with all things Zoom. Um, so thank you for everybody who has assisted there. Uh, another thanks goes to CU Professor Tom Ye, who generously offered to informally mentor the startups for this meeting and also connect them to CU uh, computer science students if they needed additional team members. And then also a big thanks to one of our uh, startup founders, Logan Serkovnik from Thumper AI. Logan, thank you. You were the original visionary behind this meeting. Logan asked me if he could practice his pitch. And so we cooked up this, uh, this idea for, for the, uh, the chat tank. So thank you, Logan. Uh, this is our third meeting. We are at about uh, 575 members. And um, we launched at the beginning of March. So it's great to see the, the excitement and the growth around the club. Um, uh, upcoming meeting tomorrow night, you've probably seen, we actually are collaborating with a conference in Broomfield for an event that's an AI meetup. And um, I'm gonna ask uh, Anna to post the details for that. That's going to be keynotes from Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and, um, you know, sort of networking reception appetizers and stuff. So there's a fee for that. If you're interested, uh, the link is there. You can get more details. They are getting ready to close down registration. So if you're interested in going to that, I would uh, certainly encourage you to, to sign up soon there. Um, Okay, I just wanted to talk a little bit about sort of planning this meeting. Um, when we did that, we were not experts in how to do a pitch night, um, but we know how to use AI tools. Uh, so we're not just the meetup that talks about AI, we actually use it. We kind of eat our own dog food here. So um, for this meeting, we really use ChatGPT extensively with the, uh, the model GPT-4 and it was really helpful in, in planning the meeting. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the full prompt, but uh, maybe Anna can post it uh, in the chat window. It, it, and ChatGPT helped us really um, with questions to ask the startups, the selection criteria for how to pick those companies, um, judge feedback, you know, the judge, the, the judge evaluation form, it, it was truly instrumental in planning this meeting It saved a ton of time and gave us like some real expertise, a real expert voice. And um, it's a great example of like the practical help that you can get from these tools. So this wasn't, you know, write a love sonnet in the voice of Ernest Hemingway. It was really um, how to how to get this thing off the ground, how to do the meeting. So, so it was very cool to see the tools being used um, and and being so helpful in, in in a practical way. I'm sure you guys are all using this in in your day to day work as well, and and you know how how useful it can be. Um, okay, why don't we uh, get started? We have a lot of presentations tonight and sort of a tight time frame. Um, we're, we have seven companies that are going to be pitching, and here's how it's going to work. Each company will have seven minutes to do their pitch. So they have a pitch deck. They're going to go through one by one in the order that they're listed in the meeting announcement. And then we'll bring the judges up on stage, and we'll do five minutes of Q&A. 
with with each entrepreneur. And I'm going to introduce each startup as as we go one by one. After the first one, I will introduce the judges. Um, just a point of feedback, there's um, there's this reactions button at the bottom of the screen, you know, where you can sort of like send a thumbs up or, you know, something like that. And when you're presenting, it, it, it really helps to to see the audience reaction. So I, so I encourage you, like when you see something cool, like, oh, my gosh, what an idea. Check that out. Or what a great, you know, what a great comment. Send them, send them some love. You know, it's it's feedback from the audience. We're kind of in this webinar mode, so they're not they're not really seeing your faces um, right now. So that that's the way to to do it. You know, to get your your feedback heard and and also just connect with the speakers and and, and give them some love. Um, okay, so our our first pitch is going to be uh, from Boston Goobler of Note Writer. And uh, Boston's coming up on stage right now. Their service employs AI to streamline and simplify the note writing task for healthcare professionals, providing faster, precise transcriptions at a lower expense than their competitors. And for each of the um, the companies that pitch, I'll ask Anna to um, to sort of paste uh, post their name and and the short blurb about them. So if you're interested, you can copy that out of the chat window and um, you know just have that have that handy. So um, okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, Boston to go ahead and uh, take it away. Thank you for coming tonight. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here with you. My name is Boston Goobler, and I am an MD MBA student at the University of Colorado. While I've been studying medicine and business for the last four years, I've realized an enormous opportunity to disrupt the healthcare field that I'm excited to tell you about tonight. When I started medical school four years ago, I had no idea that in my future career, almost half of my time would be spent in front of my computer. The reality is that for most physicians in the United States, 45% of their time goes into using electronic health records. Uh, this consists of sending prescriptions to pharmacies, consulting with other physicians or responding to comments or uh, notes from patients, but the bulk of that time is spent writing notes. So every patient-doctor interaction uh, requires a note to be written about what, what happened. And doctors can spend two to three hours every day writing notes on the patients that they saw that day. And this can result in a significant burden for healthcare providers, whether they're doctors or NPs or PAs. And as you can see from this 2022 medical economics survey, almost three fourths of our healthcare providers feel burned out right now. And if you look at the breakdown on what causes them to feel burned out that they attribute it to, those top three percent, those top three uh, reasons add up to about 60%. And all of them relate in some way back to electronic health records and this burden to write notes for every patient visit. This all started back in 2009 when the federal government required anyone receiving Medicaid or Medicare patients to have and use an electronic health record as opposed to paper charting, which is how it used to be done. And the, the vast majority of medical professionals today use electronic health records and are overburdened by it by having to uh, uh, record things in, in this way. And the way that most doctors deal with it is um, one of three things. They can hire a scribe, which is an in-person uh, helper who's the, there in the visit, writing the note as the visit happens. They might use a dictation service, speaking their note and then sending it off to be uh, transcribed. Or they might write the notes themselves during the visit. Perhaps you've experienced this. You're in there, you're talking with your doctor and they're typing on their computer. Most likely what they're doing is they are recording the note so they don't have to do it later uh, at home in their pajamas after the workday. Um, 
The problem with these is that it's, ex it's very expensive to have an in-person scribe. Dictation services are slow and expensive, and writing notes while you're in a visit with a patient is distracting. So there's, there's been several companies that have thought this is a great idea to use artificial intelligence to address this problem. And you can see some of these startups or smaller players um, along with some bigger fish that, have, that are trying to uh, do this. But as I looked at all the options that there were, I, I thought to myself, why are these AI companies so expensive still, as, as expensive as in-person uh, uh, scribes? Or, and why, why can't we apply what we have? Why do we need to spend so much more time developing AI when what we have, I've found, works really well? And why can't we focus just on solving the problem of notes rather than trying to have a comprehensive solution? So it was with those thoughts in mind that I created NoteWriter, an AI, as Dan said, an AI website application that allows doctors to get help writing their notes. I will say if you saw in the announcement initially, we called it NoteWriter. We got some feedback that that's a little hard to understand. So we went with NoteWriter. And here's how it works. A patient and a doctor are visiting, and as they do, NoteWriter is listening, whether in on a app or on uh, the desktop, and it's pulling out all of the medically relevant information that is said during the visit by the doctor or the patient. It sends those details to the AI, uh, which then compiles it into a note, just like the doctor would write it, and sends it back to the doctor who is able uh, to upload it into whatever electronic health record system they're currently using. And it saves a lot of time. Th this is an example of the prototype we have uh, working for NoteWriter, and it's very easy to use. The doctor clicks start at the beginning of the visit, they click stop when it's done, and within 30 seconds, this appears and they have uh, a note. And I have to just comment how remarkable this is, that an AI can take the complex human interaction that is a doctor-patient visit and pull out all of the medically relevant uh, details only and then put them where they would go. Um, this is from my four-year-old uh, who very much, very uh, willingly offered to, to help with that. So uh, like I said, note writer can save doctors time and has the potential to save doctors a lot of money, especially when compared uh, to other offerings that are on the table. If you think on the low end, a doctor might earn on average $100 an hour. And if NoteWriter can save them two hours a day, which adds up to about 40 hours in a working month, $4,000 a month that could be saved. Um, and that's not including the time that they might use to see even more patients uh, from, from using NoteWriter. And we do that, um, we would offer that at the, at no, uh, the uh, price of $299, which would, makes it an easy sell and within reach for any uh, practice, no matter how small. So the market that we're targeting is huge. There's 220,000 private practice doctors in the United States. And based on our estimations, if we can capture just 1% of that, even, even half of 1% of that, we are a multi-million dollar business, a uh, multi-million dollar a year business. And we feel that that's easily within reach of our, of our team. This is a look at our sales, or sorry, our development timeline and kind of where we're at. And, and you know, we're big dreamers, but what we're looking at right now is we need to work on HIPAA compliance. HIPAA is the privacy laws uh, that the United States has. And we know what we need to do. We just need a little bit, a few more steps to get there. And then a few more months of development and testing to get the product ready to go to market. So it's with those steps in mind that we're currently offering 15% equity in our company uh, for $150,000. We anticipate about 50,000 will be needed to finish development. The rest goes to customer acquisition. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you want me to go over summary financials in the future, I'd be happy to do that with any of you. And I hope you'll be interested in coming with me to revolutionize healthcare one note at a time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Boston. That was awesome. Really appreciate that. Okay, I would like to bring our judges up on stage right now. I will introduce them. Um, so let's see, Boston, I think you just need to stop sharing and oh, then yeah. we'll go back to, uh, here we go. So uh, our, uh, let me introduce our judges, uh, Ann Farrakane and Matt Zweibel.
both are experienced tech investors who bring important angel and venture capital perspectives to the event. Uh, Anne Farrakane brings over 15 years of leadership from companies like Lyft and Google. She's the founder of Patch Ventures, where she's investing in projects that boost economic opportunity within the tech sector. Her academic background includes a Harvard master's degree and a Wharton bachelor's degree. Um, and uh, also coupled with software engineering training from the Flatiron School. Also joining us is Matt Zweibel, who's the Denver general manager at Drive Capital, where he backs early stage founders, particularly in the AI sector. His career is rich in entrepreneurial community support from running nonprofit Pledge 1% Colorado to managing the Denver co-working space Galvanize. Matt also started his first company in high school and has organized the Seed Angel Forum, promoting connections between investors and startups. So thank you, Anne and Matt, for joining us. Um, we'll just have you guys unmute, and then I will uh, step down, let you guys take it from here. And so we'll have uh, five minutes in Q of Q&A. Thanks for the introduction. Nice to meet you uh, all, and thanks for having me. And hi, Matt. Um, Hello. Hello, panelists. Um, and, and Boston, excellent job. I know we have five minutes, so I won't um, sort of dive in and be um, give, give an intro or how I think about investing. Uh, but um, I will say just uh, maybe 30 seconds on as an angel investor, usually there are ranges, right? Some people might give hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some people give up to 10K. So this is just knowledge for for everyone. Um, usually I fall in what's called the small check um, angel investor. Usually I come on um, as a strategic investor advisor where I would be on the cap table to help advise uh, for, for a small amount given uh, my operational experience. So just making sure people are aware of that. Um, so I have lots of questions. Awesome that you have what I would call um, founder product fit. This is an area that you are working in and um, have seen the problem. So I think very compelling to understand you have this problem and um, that there's you know, quite a bit of pain between the asynchronous note taking. I do have like a one or two tactical questions that I'd like to better understand and then maybe broader. So my first tactical question is, you showed an example of the tool, still trying to get an understanding about whether this solves the asynchronous. My understanding from what you detailed is that the primary problem is that the doctor has to kind of do these notes later. Sometimes they do dictation, but there's a lot of time spent following the visit, summarizing these notes. So I just wanted to get a better understanding of how NoteWriter um, solves the asynchronous component. Is it like what, what will they tactically be doing with the tool and when? Great question. So the, the asynchronous side of it, do, it doesn't necessarily have to happen at any given time. Um, Note writer, it works so fast that it would give them the option. You know, they finish the visit with the patient. It pops up on the screen. They finish their note right there before they go see their next, next patient and then they move on. If they would rather write their notes at the end of the day, the, the, the notes are all there ready uh, to be reviewed and, and added to if needed. Okay, and so the tool is reformatting a limited amount of inputs into something cleaner? Is that what the, the basics are? Yeah, so in, instead of the doctor having to remember, oh, they said this and I thought this, the note writer takes the conversation and supplies it all there for them. So um, that, that, that's the time saver. Okay, I'll kick to Matt. And then if we have time, I'll come back to Matt because I want to steal it still. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So I want to piggyback on that. <clears throat> I'd love to chat a little bit more about accuracy. So I have to imagine that not everybody has probably like a podcast style microphone sitting in their doctor's office. So mm -hmm. talk me through sort of, obviously there's a human in the loop being the doctor itself, but talk me through what that process looks like. Yeah, great question. Um, First part is that the, the transcription side of it that we use to, to get, you know, from voice to text uh, for an, an AI to use um, is the Whisper uh, open AI option, which is remarkably accurate. Uh, but as far as capturing the sound goes, that, that, that is a problem. And um, one plan that we have is offering 
you know, our own microphones uh, to people that, that sign up and using either their existing computer or we provide a computer with kind of sound design in the patient in the exam room uh, to be able to capture the visit as, as accurately as possible. Cool. Um, and then just thinking about who your customer is. So two questions on that. Number one, you said you had a price point of 299. Mm -hmm. Is that per doctor or per practice? That's per doctor, per user. Per doctor. Okay, great. Um, and then just out of curiosity, 200, 220,000 private practices across the country on average, one doctor, three doctors. That, that's a great question. I, I don't know off, off the top of my head that, that number, but from okay. my experience, most practices are, more, it, it's pretty, it's a pretty heavy burden to run a solo practice. You might see that in more rural areas. Um, but it's, it's typically at least two just to be able to help each other. Got it. And then I'm just kind of curious because um, I have to imagine that nurses also have to write some sort of notes whenever they interact with a patient. Yes, um, they do. <laughs> so what, is, what does that look like? I can't imagine that it's that much of a lift to sort of train them, but I'm curious, you're going after private practices versus hospitals. Hospitals feel like they have more staff, higher revenue. I'm just kind of curious what, what, what the distinction there looks like for you. And then I'll kick it back to Anna. Yeah. Going after the, the doctors, um, training a nurse who should be setting up your next patient while you're visiting with one patient isn't, you know, is, isn't as effective. So, uh, we, we feel that going after the, the doctors uh, initially, at least is the better, uh, the better play. Awesome. I, I have two questions and I'll do time, time checks. So one is um, about your go-to-market and distribution. So similar kind of feeding off Matt here. Tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about going to market. I mean, if you're kind of going direct to the doctor, have you thought about how much the cost of acquisition might be? You know, what's your sort of model there? Yeah, so our, our team is pretty experienced in, in sales, uh, and we, we feel that we have an extensive enough network to initially, you know, our first hundred customers could come just from people we know or the people that they know. And once we have those first customers with their reviews and, and getting feedback and all that, then we would want to go for a more nationwide rollout, you know, marketing and, and all of that. But yes, initially, it would be direct uh, sales going right to the doctor. Okay, got it. And then the other question I had was you flashed a few competitors and substitutes. Um, I, and, and you kind of commented that they were very expensive or they're doing more. So my hunch is that the reason why they might be doing more is um, that it takes quite a bit of work to do integration with EHR, all the EHRs. If you're not going to build the EHR itself, there's going to be integration challenges. So I just curious, like how much um, you know, where are you going to start basically? Like how, how many EHR, you know, EHRs you think about integrating with and, uh, you know, have you thought about what is the end to end solution and the MVP that's required in order to be just a quick note, we're almost out of time. So just Over. a quick, okay. quick, quick answer on this Boston. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, quick answer is that, uh, copy and paste works with all EHRs. And from our interviewing potential customers and showing them the product, they said, yeah, that, that, that's getting this is worth that little extra time. Um, so we, yeah, we're sidestepping the integration process for now. I, I personally think AI is going to transform what EHRs even look like in the next few years. And um, so we're, we're, we're just attacking it uh, through a cop yeah, copy and paste, I guess. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Thank you Thank very you much. So Thanks, Boston. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Matt. That, that was great. Um, our next pitch is uh, from Logan Serkovnik of Thumper AI. And um, Thumper AI delivers advanced AI solutions for quality content generation while ensuring fair remuneration for contributors and promoting ethical marketplace practices. So Logan, take it away. Thank you, Dan. And I'd also like to take this time to thank all of our judges and, and all the other people uh, in the group who volunteered to make this night possible. Um, I'm Logan Serkovnik. I'm, I'm the founder of, uh, of Thumper AI. And tonight I'd like to talk to you about our vision for uh, an equitable AI image platform. 
the generative AI image space has many problems. Some of the cha or your challenges and the some of these challenges are ones that are common to generative AI and a lot of software, such as we have a very complicated AI system that we need to distill to an easy user experience. And we'd like to let third party developers and content creators build their own content and monetize it within our ecosystem. But what we think is the biggest challenge with generative AI image today is the, is the issue with artists and photographers and people who are the data creators getting compensated, with the people creating models getting compensated, and with the legal uncertainty around them. Today, a small art, an artist who wants to train a model on their own data and or a business that wants to train a model on their own data can't simply go do that without involving the foundation models that are trained uh, of uh, on, on that have been trained on copyrighted images throughout the internet, uh, and and these images and this practice has resulted in billion dollar lawsuits that range from in industry incubants like Getty Images to small mom and pop artists on on art station, and this has become so a, a huge problem for everyone who wants to use text to image models, and it's. And, and, and while, while these lawsuits are proceeding today, I think it's important to remember that in, in sort of the history of copyright issues and copyright sort of technology, what we've seen over time is the creatives usually win out. And even if, the, you know, and, and creatives are very good at banding together and lobbying to make sure that their voices are heard. And I think it's ethical that creators are get compensated. And so this is, and so one of the reasons why we've created this platform today is to try to create an ethical marketplace for a, for generative images that allows creators to get compensated fairly and to build the next generation of tools. And the, the, this whole copyright question has been very confusing, I think, to not only a lot of a, generative AI founders and investors and, 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 and advocates and fans, but it's, it's, I, I think it's been really confusing for a lot of people. And in order to understand that, we'd like to take you back in time about 20 years to another company that was uh, doing that, that ran into some issues with copyright and that company was Napster and the Napster story as we know with peer to peer file transfer ultimately ended with, where file peer to peer file transfer exists today but there's not any companies making money off of it or monetizing it or if they are they don't exist for very long and the real winner of this was Spotify and today, our solution is how do we build the ethical generative AI Spotify like platform for tomorrow that will fairly compensate artists and photographers? And, you know, and so what would it, what would this platform, you know, if we could envision it, what would it look like? Well, we would need it to be integrated and, you know, in the sense that we would want to be able to connect people who want to create AI with people who want to uh, with, with artists who are licensing their models out. Those artists, we need to verify what data are going into their, their models. And we need to make, make it easy to do searches for, for, for different prompts and different things that allow users to learn how to use it. We need to compensate those artists. And then you, we, need, we need to verify that. And we also know that the space is, 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 is rapidly evolving. And because of that, we know that we need to have third party tools so that way the latest advancements can be brought to the platform. And so today we've made progress on this really grand vision. The progress that we've made is we've, we've been able to create kind of an, an experimental alpha version of the product that includes a mobile, which includes an AI image generator and a uh, gallery for, for, for doing prompt sort of database and search. And we're in the process of building out our marketplace. When we finish building out the mar AI marketplace that will allow training um, and, and sales of these models, we will launch an open beta, hopefully sometime within the next two months. Um, our initial model for this, for, for this is going to be a bring your own model, where at first we're going to allow people to we're going to grandfather people in with current models. Um, and say that anyone who uses the platform, if you use the plat, you know, you're on, you know, you have to take responsibility for the models that you choose to own and we'll charge enough, we'll give you the ability to use that model, but, you know, you take the full legal responsibility for it. We will give people pay per use or subscription options and we'll make sure that every time a model's run, we're going to try to remunerate at least 20% initially as the platform evolves, we'll open it up to multiple payment points for artists to choose their own uh, price points for their models. 
And we, we've tried to build a very sort of mobile friendly UI that's both powerful and easy to use. The timeline, the timeline today is, you know, we've started work in 2022. We've kind of launched our public beta and hopefully in the, in, the, in the next two months, we'll enter an amnesty period for current models that are maybe trained on infringing work. And in, within two years, we'll, we'll begin to nudge people over uh, to only models that have been verified as, as, as ethically and sort of copyright sound models. Um, we really the question one of the questions is like the timing or why now why is why is now the time to build that we think that the reason why why we need to do this right now is because we're seeing these conflicts between the people between artists and people who've created models and we also think that there's a limited amount of time before regulation and different things come in that will force everybody to do these things and that by getting ahead and building this platform now is the ideal time to bring this to market. Our target market is ranges from everybody from enthusiasts to professionals. Enthusiasts being people who just love generative AI art as a sort of entertainment hobby. Professionals as in people ranging from marketers, graphic designers, realtors, anybody who's using stock images today or creating uh, visual content. So we, in, in trying to value the size of the, the market, it's a little challenging, but what we, the way we've tried to look at it is, you know, based off of some reports that we found is we think that, you know, that the generative AI market as a whole will be worth $109 billion by 2030. We believe at that point in time, the image part of that will be 20 per, about 20% or $20 billion. Of that, the US market, we believe will be $10 billion. And we believe we can capture the US and European market we believe we can capture about 10% of that at $1 billion in 2030. The team right now is me, uh, Logan Serkovnik. Uh, I'm a, for, uh, a former data scientist. Um, Elena, Elena is our founder, and is, our, is a, another founder and responsible for design and artist relations, and Ingrid Schneider, our chief marketing officer. Um, thanks for listening, everyone. And if you're interested in exploring our alpha product, uh, if you enter the code ch uh, chat tank on our thumper.ai, you can join our alpha uh, experimental experience. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Logan. That really uh, answers an important question. I mean, even uh, important issue, even in the little work that I've done generating images, I, I've seen artist signatures come out in the image that's generated. And it's like, that doesn't make you feel good. So uh, let's bring, uh, why don't you just uh, stop sharing your screen and then we'll bring Anne and Matt up, please. And um, I will let you guys take it from here with Q&A. Thanks. So I recognize uh, you probably don't have a crystal ball, but I'm curious, just based off of your sort of expertise in the space, like where do you envision legislation going around this topic? So I think if we look to Europe, who Europe has kind of led the way with things like GDPR, Europe's already proposed that, you know, all models have to be um, disclosed the data that they're trained on as a, as a first starter. And if you're disclosing all the data that you trained on, you need a platform to do that. And, you know, and then you need to, because people will need to be able to see that. Um, so I think that's going to be kind of, you know, in the U.S., there's always this challenge of gridlock in Congress. But I do think that, that at a minimum, people are going to force people to disclose what data that, are, that, that those models are trained on. And the last Supreme Court case actually involved um, uh, the Campbell soup. I'm trying to forget the, I forget the name of it, but, but the- Andy Warhol. Uh, Andy Warhol lost the Supreme Court case that came out about a couple of weeks ago, and it was over whether um, copying an image from a photograph onto a print is transformative or not. And the Supreme Court said no. And it was fair with a fairly strong majority. And if the Supreme Court is looking at signaling that, you know, they're not a fan of trans of overly broadening transformative and is actually trying to take that back in, in preparation for generative AI, I think that we'll see a lot of these companies find that, you know, they, you know, that they need to go back to training on data sets that are licensed and not copyrighted. And that, and that I think Europe's proposed some crazy things even 
like, you know, forcing every model in the country to register. I don't think that will happen or is not necessarily practical, but I do think that there's going to be a heavy focus on, you know, on the data side. I think there will also be a content moderation side. Most of the models we see today have been licensed to be ethically, have ethical licenses. And I think that people are going to expect that, you know, these models not be used for harmful reasons and for people to enforce that on their platforms. Can I jump in, Matt? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Logan. Appreciate it. I heard, um, I'm just, I would love to get a little bit more clarity on the business model. So I heard Marketplace a few times mm -hmm. um and what i heard and correct me if i'm wrong so in the marketplace supply demand i heard that the supply would be the people or companies building models mm -hmm. right and the demand are people using these models That's and correct. do you do you assume that the demand are like general users who need imagery they could be businesses or consumers I think the demand is general consumers, but there's also, you know, imagine a real estate agent who wants to do some sort of home viewing image model or somebody who builds that model, you know, so there's business to business components of having a niche site as well, you know, if it's okay. convenient. And I, I think the, the general idea is make it easy enough for B2, for, B2, B2, for B2C. And if it's easy enough for B2C, you'll get some B2B people who come along the way, especially, you know, especially, you know, um, and and so and then I think my follow-up question to that, thank you for clarifying, is in the marketplace, I'm still a little bit confused about how you, this business makes money. So mm -hmm. um, usually you would take a, a, a fee for, that the payer, which is the demand, mm -hmm. would pay for the, to use this model. Um, I'm confused about how that plays into maybe offering this as just like a, a SaaS business to anybody who creates models so that it's ethical mm -hmm. versus like... Um, you know, when you're in charge of a marketplace, it costs a lot of money to build up your supply and demand to so double cost of acquisition. In addition, you're only taking a cut of the marketplace transaction. And I think in generative AI, you have a really high cost of CPU to run the modeling in the background. So I'm just curious, like, what's the business model? Like, how do you make money for this? Yeah, so so the model's cost for, for doing an inference right now, you can, it costs about a tenth of a penny to run. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, and there are, we're starting to see the first serverless GPU platforms, which can be pay per use. So effectively, so as long as you can, um, charge more than that, you, you, you will be able to make money. We likely, we've, we haven't figured out the exact price point for the marketplace, um, for allowing like a minimal price, you know, for, for how much should it cost to run a generation? So the mod, you know, so, so for, for the economics of it, you know, you, I, I think that it's that there's likely a, a version of this where you have people purchase maybe five or ten dollars of credits and they get charged maybe five cents per run. But there's also some artists who may want to say in the future that, you know, I think my art, my my custom art model is very valuable and I want to charge people like 50 or 100 dollars. And so you kind of get, you know, so I think the platform is going to be very dependent on kind of volume and how, you know, and that and what kind of the sort of supply side decides to do. I think initially, though, that the, the, the prices, you're right that there is a large, that they're relative to like advertising and other platforms, there is a large cost involved. But I think that since we're seeing starting to see GPU serverless GPU platforms, that that's going to become a lot more manageable. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. I'm afraid we're out of time for the Q&A. Thanks, Logan. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Okay, so our next pitch is going to be from Trevor Uptain of HyperChat.ai. HyperChat focuses on a human-centered approach to AI, pioneering context sharing and playing a crucial role in AI infrastructure. Trevor was a was a late uh, arrival on our uh, stage here. He um, there was another entrepreneur who joined his startup and sort of pivoted. So we're super excited to have Trevor join us. And uh, Trevor, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Dan, and uh, nice to meet you, everyone. Let me share my screen and start my timer. Uh, philosophically, I'm a bit against slides, but until the uh, AI can generate our text and images on the fly, uh, we will all suffer uh, together. Uh, so we are HyperChat. Uh, my name is Trevor Uptain. 
My co-founder is here in the Zoom as well. His name is Justin Fenn. Uh, Justin worked as a full stack engineer at Google on search and ads, and uh, I worked on the core ML team at Google. Uh, my team uh, trained machine learning models for other teams at Google, so uh, self-driving cars, you know, Waymo, uh, search and ads, and uh, of course, Bard, uh, our resident uh, competitor to GPT-4, although it's still about six or eight months behind. Really nice to meet uh, all of you. So we uh, moved to Colorado about uh, nine weeks ago to attend the Antler Startup Accelerator. And uh, we were backed by Antler after three weeks. And uh, we our initial round uh, was participated in by an angel investor. Uh, this was kind of his logo that I generated for him, uh, but he's an angel investor who has a background at companies like Tableau and has scaled companies from millions to billions. And uh, we're currently at an $11 million uh, valuation. Uh, so as Dan mentioned, our system is built around the idea of context. So uh, when Justin found me, we, I was working on a developer tool, essentially. I was using ChatGPT from day one to write code and right away got tired of typing a bunch of code and uh, context into the chat, typing in metadata about my coding project, file structure, uh, directory structure, relating functions and classes to each other. So uh, my first tool was to automatically generate the context and maximize the context window, right? So instead of just using like the ChatGPT uh, uh, interface to use the API and maximize the context. So uh, what is context in our definition, right? It's just like the cloud of information around your idea that we're passing to the large uh, language model. Uh, this gives it a much better response. So you wanna maybe chat against uh, documents, projects, uh, files, this sort of thing. So this graph that I've put here is the current model of uh, uh, really the, the the system of, of context as it exists at big companies like uh, Google and uh, AWS uh, in lane chain uh, and these sorts of dependencies at uh, the user level, uh, there, there isn't really any context. Instead, we have this nebulous sort of concept of AI agents who uh, work on your behalf. They have a toolkit, maybe the ability to leverage an LLM or to retrieve files. And then they go into your data lake and build uh, some context for the job that they're doing and return some information to you. Uh, so the idea being that these can kind of work on your uh, behalf. But uh, this conflicts uh, strongly with our approach. We uh, don't really believe in the concept of AI agents. We think that humans should be at the center of this design, and that's when it's become really good. So here is the hyper chat approach to context. So I'm trying to keep this uh, as non-technical as possible. I, ho I hope you guys like the graph, but in the hyper chat model, context is a first order interface. Uh, what does that mean? That means instead of the context uh, surrounding these AI agents, they surround humans, they surround uh, tools, they surround projects, they surround ideas. And then there, uh, uh, there's the, also the ability to compose these contexts and merge them together or pull them apart. And so when we design our system this way from the ground up, and this has led to a really unique uh, UI UX that I won't show during this, but we have, and I would be happy to show anyone uh, after the presentation. Um, uh, uh, this leads to an architecture that is, is fundamental to the entire uh, ecosystem. So, um, and it leads to things like this, right? So this is my example here. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but there are these uh, on the right-hand graph, there are these uh, two guys. And uh, so the left one is my coworker, Paycon, and the right one in the blue is me. And uh, we sat next to each other at Google and Paycon always asked me uh, questions throughout the day. He, he loved to ask me coding questions and, and get help. And I love to help him. Um, but there's a, a lot of uh, issues there, right? Like there's a little bit of a language barrier. He's working on a completely different project. I have no idea what he's doing. And so um, in, in, in our vision of the future, all of the work that Paycon has been doing along the way, we're going to build context around that. And then uh, in one click, Paycon should be able to share that context with me. And then I should you know, only take a few minutes to onboard to what he's doing. I can even chat against that context and figure out what he's tried so far. Uh, so this is a very simple example. Um, Let's continue. So HyperChat is layer two infrastructure. What do I mean by this? Uh, at the bottom level, there is the actual large language models themselves, like GPT-4. At the top, there are all sorts of uh, applications, uh, uh, you know, full stack applications. In the middle, just for as a simple example, we exist at this infrastructure uh, level, right? It's like all developers who are trying to leverage LLMs and don't want to become AI developers. So uh, here is our stack. Um, at the bottom, we're plugging into enterprise data. So just like cloud integrations, uh, Slack, Google Drive, anywhere that enterprise data lives. 
Uh, we have our own storage solution, which I won't go into here. Uh, we have designed a context engine to manage all this orchestration and composition of context. And then uh, we're building in, of course, uh, an API for uh, third parties and for our own integrations to look into HyperChat and then a UI UX where all of this is made possible, right? And so instead of becoming an AI developer and figuring out link chain and uh, you know build, figuring out this concept of context yourself, which is like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of developer hours, log into the HyperChat UI, build your context, share them one click, generate API endpoints. Uh, there are many ways that these contexts will be used. Uh, also, right, in third party integrations, right? And so we wanna uh, have this like inversion of control where you probably want to use uh, some context, maybe in like your Zapier, your Asana. If you're in Shopify, you want to build maybe like a, uh, something that's enticing someone to sign up for the newsletter. Uh, all these uh, sorts of ideas you can build and use your context in other applications uh, using HyperChat. So uh, I'm really short on time. I'm going to uh, try to run quickly through this example. So this is just another way to show the same thing. Uh, what's going on if you are uh, a full stack developer building Foo Assistant? Uh, what is Foo Assistant? It just helps you generate Foo's if you're non technical or not a software engineer. Foo is just kind of like an arbitrary word uh, we use uh, uh, for, for X. Uh, so uh, the user types an input into the Foo Assistant, and the Foo Assistant is going to rely on HyperChat to compose all of the context. And so uh, it composes the context around the prompt itself and the food chat context, and then around the user itself as well, composes it and uh, sends it back to the food assistant uh, application. I want to spend like 10 minutes here, so I'm going to move on, but uh, happy to follow up with anyone on this. Uh, so here is our uh, timeline. So timeline and product roadmap, I guess. So uh, our main focus this summer is, uh, well, we're going to raise 5 million uh, for, and we're looking for as part of the effort, uh, design partnerships from uh, large tech companies making really good progress on this. So far, we've already built uh, like a lot of the context engine. We have probably the best, in my opinion, like sort of doc chat out there. It's in closed behind a password, but we've built a lot of this server and backend infrastructure. Uh, so yeah, context builder uh, will be done in around three weeks. Uh, in around nine weeks, we'll launch a closed beta. Um, and uh, in three months, uh, approximately looking to close on our seed round, obviously like sooner rather than later. And then we're looking at a public release in around six months. Um, we uh, are bringing in our hiring an engineering team and our product roadmap is as everything you can see on the right, which I'll skip through kind of quickly. Um, cool, uh, we are pursuing design partnerships currently at all of these companies. Uh, if you know anyone you can introduce us to, that'd be great. We're looking for VP level and above on our customer advisory board. Uh, these are uh, companies we're currently in talks with through our own network, but we just started uh, last week. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, HyperChat is not just uh, Justin and myself, it is also uh, Antonio who uh, uh, set us up for this presentation. He's a former director of product at Stripe. Uh, we are working on a trial basis, basis uh, with another engineering hire, Tim Specht, who founded uh, Dub Smash and scaled it and sold it to Reddit and was a director of engineering. Um, and many other people who uh, make up our uh, sales and product team who are uh, coming along for the ride for uh, either as advisors or consultants. A UI UX engineer, Emmy, Emmy Knight, who is formerly of Google uh, working on search. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, you can send me an email. Happy to talk. Uh, Justin, I love to talk about AI anytime. And I'll also be at this uh, GlueCon conference tomorrow evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor. Let's bring up uh, Anne and Matt, and we'll start our Q&A. Um, thanks so much, Trevor. I'm totally aware of the, you know, need for like doc chat and adding context. And I see there being a lot of need in like the uh, corporate space or enterprise. Um, I you gave in a, a like a problem that you were solving. One example was like you talking to your colleague and having lots of questions. And so I wanted. I know that there are multiple uses for generic like how good can the AI technology be to do doc chat? I'm curious if you have like a very specific problem wedge that you want to solve first. Yeah. And if it is indeed like 
employee one talking to employee two, what is the source for all of that individual context for that one person and how hard would that be to build, right? So I'm curious, like what's that, what's the wedge? Yeah, so thank, thank you so much for asking that question because I think my examples are not really that I gave during this talk are not the best examples of the application of this, right? So one uh, that we're prioritizing is an invoice generator. Almost every company is asked to be able to just fill out a template or like a document, a proposal, a grant, based on context. And uh, we think a really good use case is an invoice. Uh, so a lot of companies that we know, they'll have someone sit and they pull from like a 10,000 list uh, of items to build an invoice. And it's based on the context of the job and all the people and information and emails that have uh, surrounded this. So one of our first, uh, I think, killer features that's on its own, probably like a billion dollar idea is to be able to uh, build context around each invoice uh, uh, dynamically and then send the invoice and actually bill for that. And we can do that uh, through our platform. But I mean, we want to be the sales force of AI. So I, I think it's a little hard. We're not a doc chat, right? Like we are a layer below, like if anyone wants to build a doc chat, they can use us or uh, if someone's doing, uh, taking notes for uh, medical purposes, like doctors uh, uh, doing transcriptions, right? Maybe you want to build the cloud of context around the uh, patient and all their existing EHR records. Uh, and then your other question is around how do we generate that, that context? So this is, I think, again, where we differ from anyone else who's doing something like this, because everyone else is thinking back to my first graph, they're trying to figure out how to generate the context programmatically, right? Like how do we write if else statements and store things in a vector store and build a cloud of information. Uh, but uh, context, it, it's, not, it's never gonna work that well because you're gonna always build the maximum amount of context and you're, uh, designing it around the system. It, when you instead design it around the human and you have the humans building the context, then you can make an AI with that data that becomes very good at, at building context in the way that a human uh, would do it. And so, yeah, that's our general philosophy. Not that we're discarding the way, the ability to generate context programmatically, but rather that we're starting with humans because they're the ones who can do it best. They know how humans will use it. And then we can build our proprietary AI uh, to generate it uh, with, with the model. So based off of your customer advisory board slide, it sounds like you're going after enterprises to start. Yeah, we're, we're targeting an enterprise, but we, we are, we're are a product first, uh, a product led company. So you will be able to, um, uh, in hopefully, I mean, I, I hate to make promises in terms of weeks, but we're looking at our, our nine week timeline. We want you to be able to log in, use, start using it, hit on the free tier and, you know, not have to contact our sales team. So we are targeting, uh, enterprises and we're uh, going after, uh, uh, enterprise use cases. And we're looking especially at the thorny problems. Like we really like uh, legal and medical uh, manufacturing automation, sort of like consulting, uh, things that other uh, startups are shying away from. We think we're uniquely positioned to kind of work with the thorny problems and, and, and make really good controls around data privacy. Okay, cool. That was my question was around privacy, since I would imagine that it's not going to be easy to get into enterprise without having that quill in your cap. So talk to me yeah. more about how you're viewing that. Yeah, I mean, there's like, there are several uh, stages of security when it comes to enterprise. Well, okay, so don't type anything into the chat GPT UI, right? This is how these Samsung employees got in trouble. So anything you type in there, it's fair game. They'll just train the AI on it, okay? Then you can use the API. Uh, so you're still sending your data unencrypted over the wire, but at least they're not going to train the AI on it. Uh, at the next level, you can uh, do maybe a direct integration with Azure, assuming you're still like using the open AI models. And it's really good. They have like enterprise grade security. They're the only ones who can do stuff for, or like they're the only cloud provider for department of defense and this sort of thing. So they are really good. And I think most enterprises will be pretty good with that. Then they're, but they still don't like to touch legal and medical. So there is going to be uh, uh, very sensitive data. And when we get to that, we're looking at more of like an on-premises uh, solution with with Llama or one of these other really good models. So all that to say, right, um, we care about security. We're looking for a partner right now and, and in talks with a few potential partners who are going to, of course, going to be SOC 2 compliant and have audits and all of this stuff. But uh, our system is agnostic to the model. We don't care if it's GPT-4 or something else. My GP4 is like way better than anything else that exists, and it probably will continue to be for a while, but uh, our system will work uh, regardless of, of model. In fact, you can 
uh, drag and drop um, as many models as you'd like into your context, or just go to Hugging Face and, and plug them in in like one click and uh, use that as part of your uh, context and turn them on and off. Thank you, Trevor. And thank you, Matt and Anne. With, with that, we're out of time for that uh, Q&A session. I'm going to see if I can give you guys a sneak preview here of our elegant prize. This is our uh, trophy that's going to be going to the winner. It's a little bit hard to see, but uh, we've customized it with our uh, user group branding. So it's pretty special. Um, okay. Our next, uh, thanks again, Trevor. Appreciate that. Our next uh, presentation is from Carl Dakin of Entrepreneur Coach. Let's bring Carl up. Uh, the Entrepreneur Coach acts as a 24-7 online mentor that can provide quick access to information focused on entrepreneurship. Okay, Carl, take it away. We just need to unmute Carl. Hang on, Carl. Just got to get you unmuted. There we go. There we go. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, um, welcome to everybody to listen to my little pitch here for Entrepreneur Coach. Uh, this is one of the number of products under the banner of Entrepreneur Pro, uh, a company that was created to help entrepreneurs uh, with some of their daily tasks. And uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we started working on this as a joint venture between my company and a learning management system called uh, Knowledge Avatars. And we decided that we wanted to come up with something that used AI to answer the questions of entrepreneurs as they come up on a 24-hour basis. And out of this arose the, the concept of the entrepreneur coach. Uh, this product is currently available and uh, you can go to the website that's shown here on the slide, and you can both speak to and type in questions to the entrepreneur coach, and it will give you an answer. And uh, as we worked through this, uh, part of our goal was to intentionally bias information from OpenAI, uh, which is the underlying platform, and in order to get to higher, more accurate information that fits up with an entrepreneur. Uh, as you're aware, uh, OpenAI gives you consensus information. It has its own biases, which are inherent to taking general information from all sources. And sometimes this is inaccurate, uh, sometimes a little, sometimes in a significant amount. So we decided that we wanted this to be more accurate and we put a learning management system over the top. We started curating information uh, to train up the coach to be more and more accurate every time you ask it a question about entrepreneurship. Um, and the coach can be installed as a widget on any website, anywhere, anytime. So you've got access to the information where you can go to the coach and you can say, hey, here's my question about this part of business, uh, raising capital, anything else that comes to mind. And um, so whether you're on your phone, you're on your laptop or in a, on your desktop, you can still get to this information any time of the day. So as I was explaining earlier, uh, essentially we started with the basic open API platform and then we use the knowledge avatar system, which is a learning management system on top of that. So we're starting to basically move from general information to more of a hybrid information with curated uh, entrepreneur biased information. And then we, we moved it even further where we started talking about, I wanna make the information unique and specific to a particular organization so that if I uh, want to ask questions about the organization, I'm not going to get 20 answers about 20 similar companies. I'm going to get information that's exactly about that particular organization. So one of the advantages that come out of this, and we use chat GBT as, as a comparative thing, is that we present both image and voice. So you get a personal 
feeling that you're talking to someone and you're interacting with someone, not an empty concept hanging in the air. But most importantly is all the information is presented in what we call a contextual hierarchy or learning pass. And this means that there are granular levels, hierarchies of information, which will take you from the 100,000 foot level down to ground level and answer questions at whatever level of detail you want to train up to coach to answer questions on. We can then also link it to other sources of information. So if you want to go beyond the coach, we can put in a link to a web page, a book, uh, author, or some other source of information. And so ultimately, we can customize this to fit a particular organization. We can do this for any organization of any size or scale. And we've monetized this, which gives us all kinds of options on how we bring this to market. Um, the coach um, can be uh, trained to speak in any of 23 languages with multiple dialects. Uh, it also can have different gender uh, uh, tone of voice, different age tone of voice. So it gives us a lot of options, again, on how we can uh, customize it for a particular website. We can use any kind of an avatar. Uh, obviously, the Ottober coach, as it's presented originally, uh, we decided to use my image instead of a cartoon image. Uh, we're still not certain that was a great idea, but that's kind of where we started. Uh, but uh, you can pick an image that it may be representative of your company or of your customer. And again, you've got all kinds of customization options. So uh, where we're at today is the entrepreneur coach is kind of wearing the hat of a mentor or a docent. They're going to answer information about entrepreneurship. And then it can be trained to be a specific uh, source of information about your organization. So we sometimes talk about this as being a digital receptionist. So if you walked into a business today and the coach was sitting behind the front desk, you could say, hey, I need more information about the company. Uh, this is information commonly found on your website, but quite often when you go to the website, you have to flip to a number of tabs, you have to drop down within the different pages, and you still may not be finding the information you're looking for. Well, what we found when we, we started off was our idea was to make this a source of information for entrepreneurs, but we found that the potentially greatest value is answering generic uh, questions that are commonly answered day in and day out over and over and over again the first time you have an encounter with someone who's talking to you about your business. If it can take the time to answer that question quickly and, and genuinely, you save time for that business. Um, our goal going forward is to train the entrepreneur coach to wear all the different hats that you might find in a small business. So we started with the receptionist. Uh, right now, we're training up the coach to be a sales assistant to work with a capital campaign where it'll sit on the website and answer all the questions that you're looking for about that particular business. We have three revenue sources, sale of advertising, a rotating banner above the coach, uh, we can put in uh, customized links uh, uh, to different types of sources of products and services for affiliate fees, and then we can customize the site to fit your organization. Oops, went too far. Um, we've done some role, you know, projections on what we might be able to do in terms of revenue. Quite frankly, we don't trust any of our own uh, forecasts because the AI field is moving so fast. But we think that by 2027, we might get up to a half a million hosts and generate a fair amount of money from all these sources of revenue. So with that, if you want to try the entrepreneur uh, coach, please go to this website and ask it all the questions you want to ask. And I'm happy to take questions from our panel of judges. Cool. Thank you, Carl. Bring Ann and Matt up, and then we'll start our q and A. I'm sorry, Matt. I didn't know if you had something first. Oh. Go for it. Um, thanks, Carl. Um, really cool to see the solution that you built. Obviously, probably a very personal um, problem or opportunity, training a lot of people and entrepreneurs. So um, I always love seeing people's applications. I wanted to get a better sense of whether you, it sounds like you built, so you layered an LMS um, 
on top of chat, you know, on top of existing uh, open AI technology and then layered in the avatar, right? To, to do the um, vocalization or the generation of the content. So I'm curious, um, when you talked a little bit about the monetization side, it seemed like a lot of the monetization streams were more like allowing piece, people to host their website through you and their, their coach through you. I'm curious if you thought a little bit more about the white label version uh, where you're selling people, if, if you are able to sort of monetize the technology aspect, meaning people can use your LMS technology and use their own avatar, but host it on their own and pay you a subscription. I'm curious how you came to the monetization. Yeah, um, we started off initially uh, thinking that this would be kind of a Jimmy Cricket that could sit on everybody's web page and answer questions. And, and that started off as banner advertising. And then uh, to the point you bring up, it actually may have greater value if it's white labeled uh, for anybody or organization. They can pick their own image. They can pick the language they want. They can train it up on uh, everything about that organization. And we have fees at different levels. And this is one area where um, the changes in AI technology are so dramatic that you know, from the first of the year to just here in May, we've seen dramatic decreases in the amount of time necessary to train up the bot and answer questions on somebody. And we assume most people want to go to white label. They're going to want to put their name or their face on, on, on the avatar and, and go from that. So we have a variety of ways that we can do that, either as a subscription service or as a, a fee based upon the amount of information that we upload. Thanks. So high level, I kind of saw two different businesses being built. One sort of focused on being an entrepreneurial coach, and then you've got this sort of, maybe I'll just call it a business co-pilot that you have on the side of the, of the business. So I'm curious, like, do you have early traction in one way or the other? Are you leaning one way or the other as the business owner of this? Like, where, where's your head at? Actually, I think that we're going to end up probably getting in a bit of schizophrenia, and we're, we're going to have... Uh, the coach as something that could be on a lot of websites just as a source of information. But then uh, the company organization may want to put up their own avatar, which is the um, basically docent for all the information about their organization, which would be a different avatar and, and could be structured uh, in a different compensation fashion. Uh, but uh, where we want to go is we want to move this forward so that uh, with further development uh, in a virtual world kiosk, instead of using a website, you would go uh, on a URL link to the virtual world. You're going to encounter a kiosk for an individual business. Uh, that business can have one to a dozen different avatars who are all specialists in any part of that particular business. And they're all there to answer questions and to take the standard Q and A burden off the back of that small business and, and be there on a 24 by seven basis. So instead of being a solo entrepreneur, you're, you're suddenly have a team of 10 to 12 avatars who are working with you all the time. Thanks. Um, I have one more question if we have time, but- Sure, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead, okay. sure. Um, yeah, wanted to get a sense um, of whether you thought about your distribution, like you know where where you might want, how you might want to sell this, and yeah. So initially, we were going to work with business support organizations, and we I, I know enough people in small business and economic development that we're talking to a variety of them right now. Uh, but as this concept uh, of uh, customized uh, bespoke avatar comes along. Uh, right now, we probably would find as a better partner would be a large organization that sells products or services to entrepreneurs who has a nationwide influence and would like to team with us to make this uh, kind of a brand alongside of what they're doing and, and be a supplier of information to entrepreneurs about entrepreneurs, but also about the products or services of that partner. Thanks. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Matt.
Uh, appreciate the the presentation. I, I met Carl at the uh, AI and law conference at CU's law school uh, a while back, and he told me about his uh, he told me about his startup. So it's cool to see him come full circle to the stage here. Our next pitch is from uh, Daniel Ritchie of BrainwaveLabs.ai. Brainwave Labs empowers individuals to learn, grow in AI, stay at the forefront of change, and take ownership of their future success. I'm looking forward to learning more about this. Daniel, take it away. Fantastic. Just checking in, making sure everyone can hear me. Yes, sounds great. Wonderful. All right, share my screen here. Okay, so uh, I was just in San Francisco this past week and was explaining to someone what this was and they said, I didn't understand half of what you said, but I'm sure you're gonna revolutionize how we do business. And that's the idea of what we're trying to do here. So if, uh, if this sparks follow-up conversations, uh, this will be success. So Brainwave Labs is a, a operating title for something kind of separate from this, but the Brainwave Collective uh, is a actual Colorado co-op. And let me explain to you why that is important. Uh-oh, my uh, controls are hidden here. Hold on a second. Oh, come on. All right, we're gonna go for it anyways. All right. So uh, there's the vision involved here, and it's important for you to be a part of this to see what we're going to be doing. So first and foremost, uh, we all know that AI is going to be exceptionally disruptive. Uh, we heard from a lot of people here uh, how it will change the way they do uh, business. Um, for our electronic medical record person, uh, I do need to follow up with you. I have a contact at CU that would be valuable. And uh, the, the short version is that expertise is what matters here. If there's one thing that you take away from this whole conversation, it's domain expertise. Uh, we, we know AI is going to make a big impact, but what really uh, is the rocket fuel is when you take someone who knows what they're doing, who has a decade or two in their career, and uh, you plug AI in and accelerate what they're working on. Uh, the problem, of course, is that there's an awful lot of people that are now empowered to be very effective. And as a result, uh, we're going to need a lot of others who can help us get across the line. So, you know, we may be an expert in technology. I'm a, I'm a technologist. I've been around for, I don't know, 15 plus years. There are only some technologies that I know, some better than others, but there are many technologies that I know nothing about. I have to work with not only other technologists, but product design, business strategists, and others in the space to be very effective. So we have to collaborate. Uh, a lot of the conversations that you're hearing in the AI space is that uh, collaboration is key, and we believe that very strongly. The third part of this is power in numbers. We talk about AI replacing jobs, replacing individuals in a lot of different ways, but community is one thing that's untouchable, and we want to build a community here. The last is model disruptions. Uh, really what we're talking about is business models. If everyone can do anything because of what AI has empowered them to accomplish, does it really make sense to you know, get paid an hourly wage for a corporation when in a weekend you can build a disruptive product? And if you wanna go and found, you're gonna to have to find co-founders and you're gonna to have to do that on your own. Well, that sea of people doing these things has gotten an awful lot larger. So sticking out amongst uh, the noise is gonna be a challenge. So the Colorado Cooperative, uh, I should be, be specific, the Limited Cooperative Association. It's a blend of a business and a co-op, and it allows for a variety of different things. First is it is a new paradigm for the way that we operate. Um, I'm not trying to co-found. I'm not trying to work for a company. I'm looking for something in between where contributors have ownership in the things that we create together. As a result, we can share in the winnings of what comes out of this. We launch a $100 million company, we get a piece of that. If one of our peers launches a $100 million company, we get a piece of that. The rising tide lifts all ships uh, is not, not more true than it will be here. And the last thing is innovation. Ideas are always easy to come by, but being able to work with your peers and build those ideas to completion is something uh, that is hard to do. Uh, how do you feel comfortable 
openly discussing these types of things. Well, if your peers are peers who are able to win with you, you're a lot more motivated to share. So what does being involved look like? Um, you can build the future, and I want to be clear about this, and um, I just lost my timer. So uh, I've lost sense of where we are. I don't know that I'll have an opportunity to figure this out. So we'll, we'll just wing it. You can join as an individual. So if you have skills, whether those are technical or non-technical skills, you can contribute directly. And you can also join as a business. Uh, entities that you're familiar with, all the standard entities are able to join as well. So you can help build directly. You can tr contribute directly and help build this thing. The other thing that you can do is you can join as an investor. It's possible to be an investor member. This gives you a seat at the table and inside track to actual things that are happening within the organization. And um, probably is the only opportunity that you'll have to be as directly involved. Now, the downside, of course, is we're not being dictated here. We're looking for people to participate and be a part of the future. So getting out there ahead of this, um, as far as I know, there's no one else that's focused on community in this way when it comes to building AI products. And why does that matter? Well, none of us know how to spell AI. This is all brand new. Doesn't matter what background we're from, even if we're in AI, uh, the next swim lane over is doing things that we're not familiar with, and uh, we need to learn together. So uh, banding together with our peers to learn how all this works and then building solutions which we can monetize uh, will be very exciting. I think if we can do that, we're going to stay ahead of the pack in a very meaningful way. And uh, with a large enough and substantial enough community, we can really keep ahead of the pack. I, I ultimately see this being the place that people want to come and participate, not only to expand their AI skills, but also to, to build things in a community that will share in collective success. So I'll just kind of rip through these things really quickly here. Uh, nobody else is doing anything like this, as far as I'm aware. Uh, we're gonna make sure that we stay on top of all the things that are happening in AI. Uh, a lot of open source models that are coming out today, uh, Google's letter, if you haven't seen it, uh, there is no moat. Uh, they put an awful lot of time and energy into getting ahead of things, and they're no longer there. The open source models, in a lot of cases, are uh, being able to be as successful. And then demand. I can't tell you how many people have said, this sounds great. Can I hire you for my services? Well, that's part of the reason we're trying to avoid this typical model. I could, I could give up a bunch of technical talent and uh, contribute to somebody else's product, but I don't have equity, and I've you know, changed a few hours for a few dollars. Uh, so we think this is something here that we can we can change this model. So again, uh, two things that you can do here. Uh, number one is you can join, uh, whether that is uh, someone who wants to wants to help build this model out uh, as an advisor director. You can contribute as a contributing member. You can invest as an investing member, and also you can just support us. Uh, the link tree here. This. QR code goes to a link tree that has all of the links of the standard socials that you can follow and participate, my email as well. Um, and I'd love to love to talk to you about how to bring you on and have you be part of the future with us. Thank you, Daniel. Even without the timer, you totally nailed it. Uh, let's let's bring uh, Ann and Matt up. And uh, if you just stop sharing the screen, we'll get everybody. There you go get everybody on stage. I'll let you guys uh, take it away for a Q&A. Thanks. So quick question. Are there folks in the co-op today or is this sort of the launch uh, moment? So technically, uh, we are not accepting members at this time. Part of what we have to do is to, is to define the formal structure. Uh, but we do have about 20, 30 people who are interested, uh, some of which I've been working directly with. Um, one of them who used to be at Galvanize with you uh, seven years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we've got a bunch of people kind of teed up on deck for this. The formalities are something that we're finalizing right now, uh, but uh, the organization is technically launched as of about a week ago. Hi, Daniel, thanks. Um, always love the idea of shared cooperatives. Um, I participated in a lot of venture studios in I know it's a different format, uh, but um, always great to give people an opportunity to work, you know, sort of passively or on their own time. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, I guess, two questions. One's very quick, which is like, are you seeking investment or this is more like, hey, we launched and we don't need investment. We just kind of want to 
you know, build awareness and then kind of later talk about business model? That's the first question. Sure. Just to clarify, we are primarily looking for investor members over just straight investors. Uh, the model that we have is, you know, we're trying to avoid the social trap of giving up long-term benefit for some short-term gains. And I, frankly, a lot of investors need that. And I absolutely understand that, but we're trying to do something different here that, uh, you know, frankly, I want, I want everybody here to eat. I want us all to be able to retire as a result of this thing. So, um, you know, we're, we are interested in investor members is the short version. Got it. So investor members, and then um, you'll be making investments into the member community who will be building the tech. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And we do have some things, you know, teed up. I mean, there's, there's obvious economies of scale that you can benefit from for this type of thing. And, uh, you know, so there, we, we'd be happy to spend some money if we had it available. But right now we've got um, maybe six, six, you know, prospective members who are uh, able to contribute a ton of time and some really heavyweight talent towards this. So, you know, we, we're already starting to see what we can come up with as a result of this, but, uh, you know, having some, having some cash on hand is, is nice as well. Great. Thanks so much. So I'm envisioning sort of like a slew of SaaS apps that you sort of start to go out, you get some customer discovery, you figure out what clicks, and then you've got a bench of talent, both on the engineering side and then on the sales and marketing side that you can go out and, and, and push that to customers. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? It's a great way to think about it. There's, there's really um, a couple of models here that are useful. The first is that where we have kind of everything in house and we can kind of in one big push, do everything together. Uh, the other is the opportunity for people to launch their own companies uh, as well. That can be members of this. And then there's some type of, you know, Think of your typical accelerator or incubator that has some exchange. You know, we can have that type of relationship as well. Um, and then it's not so extractive. It's not like just this third party that you don't have any part of. So you kind of get to be part of that flywheel as a member also. So there's two ways that you could do it. One is the collective approach and the other is, you know, form your own entity. I mean, and frankly, you know, everyone else that's pitching here could benefit from being a part of this. And, you know, we could, we could help everyone get across the line in, in an ideal world. Thanks. And are you helping your, you know, one of the kind of challenges I see with um, various venture studios, um, and I, I'm not trying to say this is that, but just like there are some comparisons with this kind of studio model. Um, or will you be providing the others in your group, like the members who are building tech, um, other things that they might not be doing, like distribution, sales, like are you providing other units? Absolutely. The, I mean, we're we're getting those pillars put in place, but the the general idea. I mean, you think about whether it's a venture studio or a company, you know, even an accelerator. I mean, any any operation has a variety of aspects that are necessary for it to be successful. Uh, our idea is that all of the commonalities that can be shared. I mean, the the brainwave label uh, has an opportunity to stand out amongst you know one of a number of individual startups. Um, I think ideally we have the opportunity to launch, you know, one or, you know, even one or two big products will put us on the map and people will understand that we're a powerhouse of building effective solutions and we'll be one to watch, right? I, I think that's coming. Uh, so, you know, the more we have in house that we can offer directly, um, you talk about that, you know, venture studio approach. Uh, I would love some VCs to be a part of this and see this as, you know, an, another way that they could participate in, uh, you know, building a, a collective future. Thanks. So, can I ask one um, more uh, question? Yeah. Uh, I, no, okay. Go for it. Yeah, just so sorry. We're, we're just out of time. Um, Follow up. I'll be happy to answer any other questions outside of this. For sure. And thank you, Daniel. I, I hope you'll stay in close touch with our group because I think there's a lot of our members that would love to participate in, in one way or another. It, it, it's, uh, it's really cool. Wonderful. Okay. Thank um, you, everyone. Thank you. Our next presentation is from Josiah Seaman of uh, Creative Contours. Josiah has been a frequent uh, participate, uh, uh, participant in our uh, after parties, after our meetings. We've gotten to know him, and he'll be a speaker at our June meeting. Um, his company, Creative Contours, modernizes copyright law, enabling artists to claim, quantify, and monetize contributions to AI-generated art. Okay, Josiah, take it away. All right. Thank you very much. 
I've been uh, really looking forward to this for a while now. So thank you for the opportunity. And I, I have to uh, compliment Logan on uh, just really introducing this space. So that saves me a little bit of time on the problem. So uh, AI has really uh, been taking the world by storm and uh, Creative Contours really tries to address the ownership issue of art in the age of AI. So we're gonna look at tracking derived works, how artists are gonna get paid and uh, licensing and copywriting your AI work. And uh, I'm Dr. Josiah Seaman, and I'll tell you a little bit about my background at the end. So um, one of the things that I, has really been amazing here is just the sheer quantity of AI-generated art. All of the images that I'm going to use are actually uh, AI images. And so these are scenes of crowds, these are uh, bugs. So um, there's, there's really both quality, uh, quantity and variety of images that are able to be generated through AI art. And uh, so I believe that pretty soon that's going to be the predominant form of artwork in the world. And really it, it already is. And that's only growing in the future. So Creative Contours really tries to address three different groups of people that each want different things. First of all, we have the artists of all different types. We're gonna focus on uh, visual art because the, uh, the mathematics I'll get into is most tractable in that case. And they need to be paid for the art that the AI models were trained on. And many of those artists want to retain control on how that's used. I was really fascinated to hear uh, the Senate meetings uh, in the US that are going on right now in order to decide uh, how copyright is going to be handled with regard to both music, uh, visual art, as well as text and video. So this is really just going to keep on expanding and expanding. Second, we have media companies, which are both holders and producers, and they have a lot of intellectual property. Uh, for example, the entertainment industry is a $2.2 trillion industry, and they're going to be competing with uh, smaller uh, groups of people that are using AI generated content, they need to both protect their copyright and trademark uh, of their existing properties. So imagine if this was a logo that you're making. So they, um, they have a lot at stake. Finally, we have the AI users. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Josiah. Are yes. you advancing your slides? Because we're still on your first no. slide. No, You're not. Just, okay, okay, I'm perfect. just reading. Okay, uh, awesome. No worries. Thanks. Here. Yeah. Finally, we have the AI users who want their custom made art at uh, the lowest possible price. Um, so you should be on who artists, media, and companies. Is that what you're on? No, we're still on your first slide o owning your art in the age of AI. Really? Oh, okay. Um, in that case, give me a second. Um, that is a problem then. Let me do that. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. How about, does that advance it? We're st still on the first one. We see that uh, we see the vertical thumbnails on the left. If uh, click down to go to the next one. Hmm, we tested this earlier. Okay. Um, Can you click on the second uh, slide thumbnail? There there you go. Now, now we see slide two. Slide two, okay. So, so that worked. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so now we're on who, right? We're on number two right now. AI art already outnumbers human art.
Okay. Well, I'm very sorry about that. Okay. Do I have you back again? So it's just loading. Yes, now we're on who. Okay. Sorry about that. Are we back in? Yes. Okay. So now I want to address the question, how can everyone get what they want? Are we good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, the, the technical solution here, which differs notably from Logan's solution, uh, is that we, instead of claiming a single uh, image, we're going to claim regions, regions of the latent space, if you know the technical term. Uh, basically, we are taking the, the concept of a derivative work into the mathematical and legal reality. And this exploits uh, an, uh, a property of the AI models. This is their property for memorizing uh, some of their works, where uh, essentially, we can locate uh, the most similar image for a registered work and then uh, find the uh, artist's images which contributed to that work. This has some really desirable properties. Now, artists want three things. They want credit, compensation, and consent. Credit uh, allows us to show what the main contributions to each AI art piece are. So the latest models are actually a combination of uh, multiple art pieces and styles that are combined together. And so in this case, we take, for example, the top 10 contributions. That allows us to go to the next C, which is compensation. Uh, being able to pay artists for contributing to the model. And uh, that's based on the performance uh, concept in, in copyright law. And then uh, consent, uh, basically when an artist registers uh, under the model, they're able to uh, say what sort of licensing purpose they're okay with. And this is done once, and then all other licensing is just handled automatically. So it's a single click. And then uh, what this does is that everything can be licensed in bulk from there on out. So let's talk about money. AI users are spending uh, more money per household per month because they're getting something that's better quality and custom content that's created for them. So they no longer have to shop around for something that was made without them in mind. There's also no administrative overhead. So they're getting a better quality product. The media companies are a benefit on both ends because they benefit from the multiplicative gains of using AI art and the royalties that they're gaining from having existing IP. And the artists are getting paid more because they have a back catalog that's gaining them royalties. And I have a little uh, chart here to show that the AI model is basically acting as a multiplier. So even though people are paying very little for each art piece, uh, that, that when it gets dispersed, each art piece is generating a, a, a more money than it would have been before. And that, that AI enabled multiplier is what makes it a win, win, win for each of these three groups. So there's a real world example of this. O'Reilly Books is already stitching together books and compensating each book author based on how much of their book is being used. Uh, so we would act as a, a software as a service for existing art websites and then take a, a cut of the fee and we'd hope to get uh, contracts and act in bulk. And so in conclusion, we have a platform that allows you to have IP ownership to look after copyright and trademark and creates a win-win for everyone. And as food for thought, we're starting with images, but really this is going to branch into video in the 
not so distant future, 2024, 2025. And that is a huge market to crack into. Okay, so why I'm the right person. This is a core problem that I've been working on for a long time. Uh, and my background in comparative genomics is actually about identifying shared information. And uh, there's very few people that um, have come up with these, these kind of shared information problems. And I already have a background in uh, running startups and have generated uh, enterprise development projects before. All right, thanks. It's, uh, by thank, my... thank you very right. much, Josiah. Perfect. I, I added a little bit of time because of our yeah. technical <laughs> challenge. Um, okay, so please stop sharing the screen and then we'll bring okay. Ann and Matt up and we'll do Q&A for five minutes. Take it away. Thanks so much. Um, so I wanted to get a sense of what, the, I definitely understand the problem. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think actually we've seen sort of different perspectives today on how one might handle it. So I wanted to get a sense, I kind of imagined your, I just want to make sure what I'm saying is what I'm hearing from you. Absolutely. I kind of imagined the technology of your product being like, an API that these generative groups can tap into to say like, does this image that I, let's say I'm mid journey, does this image that I just generated like infringe on any other artist who may have sourced how we generated this image? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, although it's not really a yes or no question. Essentially all images generated by AI come from some human they're like like it's all human right. derived at some point so it's more like instead of making our own ai model we're inviting people to collaborate with us um but they don't what we'd like to do is get uh bulk contracts to both work with uh work with art holders and with the a uh, ai art models in order to uh, basically facilitate those transactions. So we're not holding either of those things. We're just a facilitator middleman. So we don't really need people to change their behavior at all. We're just okay. having facilitation contracts. But do you need, I assume like you need to acquire the supply, meaning like the artists need to come onto your platform. They need to find the platform first. They need to come on. Yeah, and then they need to identify their body of art somehow. Is that correct? As like a requirement? Yeah. So that could be done on an individual artist level, but it would certainly be better if it was done with like you know we get a contract with ArtStation and just say, please put up this prompt and or send out this email to all of your artists, and we have just a thing on our website that says this is what you need to do to register your art, or we just register all of the art automatically. Um, uh, so, you know, there, there are ways that this could be done in bulk once, once we had a contract to do business. Okay, I could ask a bunch of questions about that, but I'll go to Matt okay. and uh, <laughs> So I'm kind of curious, obviously um, images and art are definitely a really good sort of beachhead. Is this it sort is of- beachhead, yeah. Yeah, is this a model that can scale to different formats or is this limited yeah. to images right now? Okay, so I'm like really restraining myself from talking about the mathematics here because, you know, audience. Uh, but the short answer is it'll work great for images. It'll work great for video. And video is a huge market, lots of money there. It does not work for text. And I frankly don't know if it works for music or not. Most of the Senate hearings was about music, and I don't know why. I guess it's because of the difference in the market size, or maybe it's because music was hit by Napster so hard, um, and there's more uh, there's more legal protections around music. Um, but uh, basically, the the short answer is that if you're doing the kind of next token prediction, then. <laughs> Sorry, uh, if you're doing the next token prediction, then the mathematics is a lot harder. Whereas if you're doing the whole image all at once, 
the it's a lot easier to say like, oh, I recognize that. Um, so I'm not going to claim that I can do text. I'm not going to touch that. No, that's helpful, but you're limited to visual formats. And I like that you're sticking in one lane instead of trying to do it all. Yeah, I'm not going to do it all. I don't, I, I, I frankly don't know what the, um, what the mathematical solution would be for text. Okay. Thanks. Dan, do we have time for more or we have sure. a Yeah, you could do another okay. question. Okay. Um, my other question is, can you again, just repeat like where you see the revenue model coming from? Meaning if you have to sign a lot of these contracts to handle the supply yeah. side, like all the artists, um, is the model that you assume that like companies like mid journey or anybody in generative AI will pay you yes. for access to this layer of information. And how do you time the, the funds basically meaning like, yeah. you know, you're going to sign these as LOIs. Yeah. So, uh, so it would, it would be great if AI art models want to, uh, want to be ethical, if I can share a revenue model with you, um, uh, if we can talk market size. So uh, if, uh, if you know, we take something like uh, mid journeys, 9 million a year estimated this year, uh, if we're, you know, taking a cut of that, uh, then, you know, we'd be looking at like 2 million this year. Um, and we'd be transforming their bad publicity because there is a lot of bad publicity right now into a positive change. Hey, look, we're, we're getting these artists paid even more than they were getting paid before. So now this is positive social change. Um, but you know, if we'd eventually partner with someone like Disney, uh, frankly, we'd just get acquired to be honest, but you know, that's a $94 billion a year uh, market, right? So that's that's a much bigger uh, fat. Uh, a much smaller market is this like uh, copyright infringement market where we'd be uh, offering evidence packets. Um, and I think that's a, that's a smaller market where we'd be like kind of uh, just supporting people making copyright claims. That's maybe a $1 million market uh, if we get 1% capture. Um, so it's it it depends on uh, on some of this is going to depend on where the legality comes out and to be frank if there is no legal enforcement um, how much people care about how uh, how they're affecting society but I I think Logan is correct and that there is going to be legal enforcement. And, and it's just a matter of time. OpenAI is pushing very hard for uh, the creation of a licensing of AI models and for the creation of an AI enforcement agency. And so that's going to hit this. So it's really just that, that we need to uh, basically have something brought online so that we can be in a position where possibly it'll be a legal requirement to do business with us, which I think is a terrific place to be in. Thank you, thank, thank you Josiah. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion. Um, continuing discussions we've had at earlier meetings here. So uh, let me just uh, ask the judges, I was going to take sort of like a maybe five to seven minute break here, let you guys talk amongst yourselves, do your final tally. Does that work for you guys? Um, and then we'll come back, we'll bring you both up and we'll get your feedback and, you know, announce the winner. Um, I just want to say, you know, we're going to have a winner and someone's going to walk away with this cheesy bowling trophy. But it's just so not about that. Like, like every person that presented tonight was a winner. It's like, you guys are out there. I'm an entrepreneur. I've started three different companies. And I know what it's like. Like, you're out there. You're pitching. You're starting these cool startups. And I learned so much just from listening to your pitches and your sort of market analyses. And I learned a lot about the AI space. So I appreciate every single one of you guys being here. And we're going to do the cheesy bowling trophy, but it's just so not about that. So, okay. So with judges, uh, does that sound good then? Um, it doesn't, Dan. Would you be able to join for maybe um, a minute or two at the end for Matt and I to just chat with you briefly? Just like before we, we kind of sure. come, come out? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay.
All right, sounds good. So we're just going to uh, pause things here for uh, five minutes, uh, or maybe seven minutes. And then I will, uh, I'll reach out to Matt. And um, then we will resume the meeting. So let's just, uh, let's just put things on hold and talk to you guys in seven minutes. So um, just to let everybody know, we are recording this and uh, <clears throat> it will be up on our uh, very popular YouTube channel. I think we've got about 30 subscribers so far. Um, so you guys can uh, check that out. Um, should be up uh, probably tomorrow sometime. And um, you guys can see your your pictures on the big screen, so to speak. <clears throat> attendees thanks for hanging in there um i know we uh probably went a little bit over our uh projected time but i still we see we still have 28 people so we haven't um everybody hasn't left that's good so thanks for thanks for uh watching the presentations here We want to people keep people entertained. I could tell them what I was going to talk about next time at the next meeting, but I didn't want to distract the judges. 
wasn't sure if they were conferring with each other. Um, yeah, let's, <clears throat> excuse me, let's fill some of this dead air. <laughs> Okay, I'm I'm great at filling dead air. <laughs> That's what I was I'm, put on this earth to do. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm I'm putting spotlight. I spotlighted you next to Dan, so go ahead. I, I I may get in trouble for this later on, but I'm willing to take that <laughs> willing to take that risk. Go ahead. Just oh, so. okay. Uh, well, I believe the the date is June thirteenth. I'm going to be talking about some near future predictions of uh, what AI is going to be doing. And uh, because I've noticed that so far when people are talking about predictions, they're really just talking about what ChatGPT is capable of doing uh, right now. So I'm going to be talking about multimodal AIs, which is uh, AIs that can both do uh, uh, speech and sound and uh, images. Uh, as well as possibly robotics and giving some examples of those and what their consequences would be. And uh, then I'm also going to be talking about the mechanics of AI self-improvement, uh, which maybe some of you guys have already used a little bit with things like auto GPT or smart GPT, uh, where you can generate several prompts and uh, get GPT to choose the best prompt or self-critique. And I'll give some examples of that and talk a little bit about that and some of the older um, AI research that's probably going to be relevant for predicting where AI is going to be going in the future. Uh, but by future, I only mean like six months out because it's changing so fast that I don't want to make predictions, grand predictions for yeah. uh, way off in the future. Hopefully we'll still be around by the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I feel fairly confident that I can make accurate predictions six months out. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> Give us some time. Thanks for that. I will now unpin you. Okay, everybody, we all back here. So why don't we bring our two judges up on uh, stage, Ann and Matt, and I will step down. So they're going to kind of explain their thinking and, um, you know, also give us a little bit of background on the investment landscape and, um, you know, share some of their conclusions as judges. Thank you, guys. Take it away. Awesome. Um, first of all, this is so fun. A uh, little bit of context on why I'm here tonight is, um, as Dan mentioned, I've uh, spent about 15 years in tech um, on the tech side of the house, and then later in my career on the operating side, leading large teams. And um, I love tech, uh, tech nerd at heart. But um, my husband and I, we live in the New York area, and we've been considering uh, moving out to Colorado. So I uh, actually joined this group on Meetup really just to like explore what the tech scene in Denver and Colorado looked like, and then reached out to Dan and he said, why don't you be a panelist? So that's why I'm here today. Um, it's been wonderful learning about you all and your ideas. And I just wanted to give a maybe quick summary of some of the way I think about uh, venture. Um, so 
three or four years ago, I started Patch Ventures, which was really my own umbrella company to invest, advise, and consult. I have invested in maybe 40, 30, 38, I can't 38 to 40 uh, pre-seed companies. I do checks of size two to 10K. Um, and a lot, and that seems really small, but as again, um, just explaining that that's more of a um, strategic investor, I usually come on to help the team with areas of my experience, like growth, data, product, operations. Um, and I usually put my founders in front of syndicates and large VCs that I have relationships with when they're ready. Um, and that's sort of the value that I add in helping them build their org and, and teams and whatnot. So that's where I come in. And what I wanted to kind of talk through about venture and, and Matt's gonna jump in here is um, in my world, typically a pre-seed round is uh, usually a minimum of three to 700,000. Um, and a, you know, a series A, you know, you maybe go from pre-seed, seed, series A, series A might some, be somewhere between eight and 25 million, depending uh, where, we're, where we're at. So those are the scale. And the reason why that um, would be the investment amount is that usually uh, what we mean by venture backed is that we believe the business would be a billion dollar um, a year or more revenue at some point. So the return for the investor. So that's the scale I'm operating at. So wanted to talk, talk about that and explain that. And then um, Matt and I were, Matt, I think we were gonna share as well about yourself and uh, how we thought about the categories. Yeah, thanks. Um, so super high level. I also operate in the world of pre-seed. Um, Drive Capital got started by two former partners at Sequoia that wanted to take the Sequoia playbook of how you invest, uh, which has a long story history, um, and move it to a new geography. And so we decided to invest in between the coasts, uh, where a third of the nation's GDP lived. Um, and we've been quite successful at that over the last decade. Uh, from the onset, we were a multi-stage investor. So, you know, first or second check in the door, all the way through a pre-IPO check. Um, with the advent of our uh, most recent fund, Fund 4, which is just north of a billion, we decided to go into the earliest stages um, and support companies moving from the zero to one phase. So we're doing that in the form of a program. It's kind of loose. It's not super content heavy. It's much more individualized based on who the founders are, what problem they're solving, um, and really what they can do with our check over the course of six to nine months. So we try to give those founders as many shortcuts as, and as many connections in the industries that they're working in as we possibly can. Um, very similar to Anne, uh, you know, or the perspective on pre-seed, um, our first check is 500K for 5% of the business. Um, and the intention is really to continue working with these companies, um, not just from their first check in the door, but hopefully all the way through an IPO. Um, so that's the quick background on sort of how we look at the world. And then I would just say a couple of things that, you know, I'm always looking for in a great pitch, um, either founder market fit or founder problem fit. Um, so we saw a couple of those tonight, which I thought were really great. Um, a clear why now is really important. Why can this company be built today when it couldn't be built a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago? Um, everybody here is lucky. We've got the world of AI that's giving you a bunch of tailwinds, but I think also finding a really big problem in an industry is, is, is important um, because AI can't be just the end all be all solution. Um, a technical team is always something that we look for. Obviously, it's much easier to pivot and move towards where an opportunity could be with a new customer segment. Um, so you know, for whatever it's worth, we, we totally respect the fact that there are dev shops out there that can build your, your product, but we'd love to see that happening in-house. Um, and then a clear ideal customer, right? So like, who are you actually going to go sell this to? Um, what's the issue that you're solving? And sort of how are you thinking about the solution? So we saw a lot of that tonight as well. So I'll pause there, um, but we have uh, a couple winners tonight, actually. Um, yeah, so uh, we had, we actually, Matt and I discussed, given there were a few um, uh, founders here tonight that were operating in a space that might not be at present what we'd call venture scale, um, we wanted to create a divergence of categories. So while there will be one takeaway winner, um, I'll introduce the category of um, 
what we'll call like awesome tech experiment that could definitely be revenue generating. Um, so we, that's the a more, maybe more minor winner tonight. Uh, we wanted to give that to Boston for um, a note writer. Um, and uh, again, I would say like really strong founder product fit there. You um, obviously have a business and a medical um, background, and this is a program that you know you're this is something you're building to solve a very personal need. You also have people in the space uh, that you know you could ask directly. Do you want this? Um, you know, I'd say like that is something to go on, and you've built something that you're using. So there's obviously going to be a lot of hurdles, and I would say my only feedback there, besides without getting into too much detail, is um, you know you're going to have to work on the pricing. Obviously, you're going to have to work on HIPAA, but really you want to think about like what is actually sustainable, who you're going to sell into. It's going to be hard to go direct to each doctor, so you want to think more maybe a partnership and trial and experiment layer. Um, but that's some rough rough feedback there, but um, great work. Thanks. Thank you, Matt, so I'll kick it to you for the winner. Awesome. Uh, virtual drum roll, please. Um, Hyperchat is our winner this evening. Um, first and foremost, um, really interesting. Uh, First off, really interesting piece of technology. I think selling into the enterprise is a pretty clear opportunity. Um, I'm actually super curious what the UI UX looks like. I think that's one of the big differentiators in the space in terms of the companies that I see on a regular basis. So um, I'm going to trust here that there is something really cool and novel that that backs that up. And if you'd like to grab some time, I'd, I'd love to learn more. Um, Salesforce for AI is a really big vision, which I think is the other thing that we look for um, in companies. You have to be uh, audacious to go after building a venture backable business. So I appreciated that much, uh, as well. Um, and the fact that you've got some ideas around a wedge that you can actually go solve some initial problems um, at an enterprise um, and then use that to sort of you know spread internally and see what other problems exist. So, um, that was my quick two cents. Um, yeah, Anne, you wanted to add anything there? Yeah, I think like Trevor, I you know, you, it sounds like the, there's a lot that you could do, and there's a lot of like boiling. You know, I don't want to you don't want to boil the ocean, so that's why I, I I could have asked a lot of questions, but was really trying to push your pitch on. Um, you know, what is the wedge? What are you very specifically solving for? And kind of trying to think about reframing the pitch, um, especially to land non-technical um, VCs over time is like, it's really, really great to sell the, um, the vision with the user story. Who am I selling into at what level? I know you talked about VP, but why are they most interested? Why will, why will they pay for it out of their budget? Right. So congrats. And uh, uh, like I said, happy to, happy to chat more about the pitch. Yeah, Anne and Matt, thank you so much. Uh, would love to follow up with you one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, sometime this week or next week. And yeah, I did want to say too, um, uh, amazing, it's just a, a lot of great ideas uh, here tonight. Um, I think we are likely a little further along too than a few of the you know, uh, startups who pitched here, right? And so I don't, I want to encourage you that a lot of the ideas that I heard tonight uh, sounded incredible, the way they were presented and, and the ideas reminds me a lot of like four weeks ago, eight weeks ago, as we've been refining our ideas. So it might, uh, you know, give the appearance that we came out of the gate with this like really amazing uh, uh, idea. But I mean, I started out building a, a federated learning tool and then I dropped a co-founder and then found another one. And then we uh, try, you know, finally got on a good idea, tried it the wrong way three times. And then we uh, started talking to customers, asking them what they wanted and honed our pitch over time, right? So this was not like uh, just a pitch. This is kind of a, a, a few months of trying and failing a lot of things. Um, so yeah, I hope I can connect with everyone here tonight. And uh, I did want to mention too, we're here at 2000 Central Avenue in Boulder. Uh, amazing, just like co-working space. The Startup Accelerator is next door. There's just a ton of like workspace out here. Would love to meet anyone uh, in person and just send me an email, trevor at hyperchat.ai. I'd love to meet up with you and uh, you're always welcome in the space too. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Great job, everyone.
Yeah. Congratulations, Trevor. Congratulations, Boston. And congratulations to everyone. You know, like Trevor said, these are some amazing pitches. Um, I learned a ton from them. You guys are all out there making it happen. And I, and I encourage you to, to keep going going for it and use our group as a resource if you if you want to, you know, pull us in for beta testing and anything else we can assist you with. So, well, big thanks to all our presenters. Thanks to the judges. We really appreciate everyone being here. Um, this was a, a interesting meeting, fun meeting, and just exciting to uh, see all the cool entrepreneurial activity in, in the AI space right now, right here. It's back to the, uh, you know, everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, so at this point, I'm going to, uh, this is just sort of the wrap of the, of the formal meeting. We've run a little bit long.